Tokyo, six years after the Second World War. The Japanese people, thousands of them, gathered to wish Godspeed to the man who directed the American occupation of their country for nearly six years. After the formal ceremonies, Japanese and other dignitaries gathered to pay their respects to their one-time foe and sincere friend. On the eve of Japan's regaining its independence, General Douglas MacArthur is recalled. Japan's occupation by a foreign power is almost over. Once a peace treaty has been signed, the Japanese will be able to walk free in their own country again. But they're still poor and outpaced by the victorious West. No one knows what their freedom will bring. The Japanese are about to astonish the world. They'll be the first Asian people to catch up with Western countries that once scorned them. And as Japan's example is followed by South Korea and then others around the Pacific, the miracle of high-speed growth will change the lives of millions. In 1945, the Japanese people paid the price for their leader's reckless military gamble. Their aggressive war, which had brought suffering and ruin to much of the rest of Asia, had ended with the destruction of their own cities and a humiliating defeat. When their emperor announced an unconditional surrender, the immediate concern was just survival. <laughs> We were desperate. Every day we woke up and had to think about what we were going to eat and how to fill our stomachs. I didn't think of anything else. There was no space for thinking about anything else. Thousands of American troops landed south of Tokyo. Japan was now to be ruled by an American general with orders to demilitarize the country. With the precision of a well-oiled machine, the occupation rolls into the city. The children have, at least, been taught the correct signals. No chances are taken, however. Full battle equipment is the order of the day. What was going to happen to Japan? Our future was uncertain and we felt anxious. I wondered, can we survive? Would something awful happen? I felt real grief. Thinking back brings tears to my eyes. To the Allies, their victory seemed to prove the superiority of the West over the one Asian country that had tried to industrialize and challenge them. The Americans doubted Japan could ever get back to the level it had reached before the war. Meantime, Japan's survival depended on its farmers' ability to grow food the country could no longer afford to import. Half the population still lived in the countryside, and methods were primitive. The more remote villages were cut off in winter. With the neglect of the war years, conditions had actually got worse. Miyoshi Oba was a health worker in northern Japan. People used the river for everything, even though it was very insanitary. They used it for drinking, for rinsing noodles, but also for the laundry, washing themselves and spitting. As a result of these conditions, diseases like tuberculosis and dysentery spread. With water supplies contaminated, almost all villagers suffered from intestinal parasites, worms. To get rid of them, 
Miyoshi Oba got her whole village to cooperate. We asked all the villagers to bring a cup before breakfast and drink the medicine. We also asked them to count how many worms they excreted later. The champion was one elementary school boy who produced 170. He marched in with the worms hanging on a long pole. I got this many, he said. The worms were wriggling around like this. It was quite sickening. Though Japanese were desperate to work, rebuilding was slow and Japan's prospects were still thought bleak in the late 1940s. Unemployment was high, the country had few foreign earnings and inflation sent prices up 1200% in four years. Labour relations worsened as newly formed trade unions battled with employers in a series of strikes. In a cruel irony, it was another war in Asia that speeded Japan's revival. In 1950, the Americans came to help South Korea when it was invaded by the communist North. Reinforcements are pouring ashore to bolster hard-pressed Yanks and South Koreans. Vitally needed guns and supplies follow in a conflict in which supplies may well tell the story. Only 120 miles away, Japan was the nearest source of those supplies. Suddenly, the Japanese had work again. Factories ran 24 hours a day. The windfall profits that the war generated were called a gift from the gods by Japan's Prime Minister. And the government's own role was crucial in getting recovery underway. The economy came before anything else. Using tight controls, ministries guided scarce funds and effort to where they were needed. Heavy industry was put first. The government gave special priority to shipbuilding. Japanese engineers studied how the Americans had mass produced cargo ships during the war. Then they copied them, prefabricating ships section by section. At Nagasaki, Suezu Uchida, who'd once made battleships, worked seven days a week. Sometimes I work very late, up to 10 or 11 o'clock at night. The worst situation, which quite often happened, was that we worked so late that we had to stay overnight at the shipyard instead of going home. That's how we used to work. Thinking back now, I worked too much. My source of energy was alcohol. As soon as we left work, we rushed into a bar close by and sat down on beer crates. We made a lot of noise enjoying ourselves. We had a drink and a snack, but we also discussed our plans for the following day. Then we had a few more rounds. Wages were low and their ships were cheap. With the new methods, the Japanese could build ships in seven months that took up to two years in the West. 
foreign orders poured in and shipbuilding became Japan's first post-war success story. The launching manager came to the ceremony with a short sword hidden under his jacket, strapped to his chest, so that he could commit harikiri if the launch failed. That's how seriously he took the launching. <laughs> At the end of the 1950s, Japan overtook Britain to become the biggest shipbuilder in the world. That ship was really memorable. It was the first ship I'd been in charge of from start to finish. The responsibility was all mine. I'd done it. I had a great feeling of accomplishment. After ships, the government fostered new industries, all aggressively aimed at foreign markets. Their cameras took the lead from the Germans. Their motorbikes were cheaper and more reliable than Britain's. The target industries were helped with cheap loans and tax breaks. The high standard of Japanese education helped industry too. With their traditional teaching methods, the schools turned out children who were numerate and used to working together as a group in a disciplined way. School leavers were desperately needed in the late 1950s. Unemployment was a thing of the past. Now there weren't enough workers. So millions began to leave the country for the cities. The same scenes were repeated at country stations all over Japan. As soon as they'd finished school, whole classes of children were signed up by recruiters for big companies. The diligent and adaptable new workers were told their jobs were secure. Imports of foreign radios and televisions were kept out. But they used the latest technology from abroad. The Americans invented the transistor, but the Japanese bought the license and were first to use it in portable radios. Hisako Sugawara came to Tokyo when she was 15. I'd never dreamt of dealing with such things. I'd no idea what a transistor was. 
I joined the company without knowing what the work would be. I was surprised when I discovered what my work would actually consist of. <laughs> Hisako Sugawara lived in a hostel with 1,200 other girls. Hundreds of miles from home, they were totally reliant on the company. Four girls shared each room with little space. When we talked together, we sat around a table between our beds and had tea and rice crackers. The bed was just for sleeping and reading. If I wanted privacy, then I could draw the curtains, so I didn't feel cramped. The paternalism of large companies and the promise of jobs for life ensured commitment. Left-wing unions were defeated and managers and workers were taught to share the same goals. And though the concentration on economic growth continued, workers started to get more for themselves. For the first time, money was put into large-scale public housing. The flats were so much in demand, they had to be awarded by lottery. After 18 applications, Taisuke Sato, his wife and their two children, were overjoyed when they were finally awarded a flat. Now they could leave their cramped tenement where they'd had no plumbing and had to use the public bathhouse. Japanese television filmed them as they made the move to a flat with far more room. <laughs> The Satos were to stay there for 30 years. We went from one room to three rooms. I was so impressed by the space. Before that, we just had a four and a half mat area. Our new flat was also good for the children, and we had a bathroom as well. You're in the bath. The greatest thing was I had my own bath in my own flat. Although it was small, I could relax in it, and it gave me a wonderful feeling. <laughs> You're singing, it's embarrassing. I was singing a song by Hanagasa Ondo. Soon the conveniences they knew the Americans had enjoyed for years were going into Japanese homes. In 1950, there'd been one car to every 200 Japanese. By the early 1960s, there was one car to every 15 people. The growing prosperity now reached the younger generation who'd not known the earlier hardships. Teenage Japanese in the 1960s had different values from their parents. They followed new fashions and fads. 17-year-old Jun Nagasawa lived in Shibuya but dreamt of California. I long to be an American. I can tell you why in one word. It was cool. 
になりましたねあの頃は、うん、であのジーンズをね I used to search for jeans as there were so few shops that sold them at the time I bought a second hand pair at the American base あの当時プレスイの音楽を最初に耳にした頃にはエルヴィス・プレスリーズ・ミュージックは何かを見たことがないので、プレスイの衝撃的なこうかっこよさと、ロックの,あの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの,あの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、ロックの強烈なビートリズムと、当然好きになっちゃったよね。Jun Nagasawa went on to form one of the first Western style groups in Japan. If their music was freer, most young Japanese still towed the line when they started work. All white collar workers, the salary men, were expected to be loyal to their companies. But some managers took this to special lengths. Kinnojo Abe was part of a Tokyo Bed Company's elite sales force. Bed to the young fellow, eh? Bed symbolized the Western style of life. We called our company France Bed. It sounded fashionable and reminded people how they could dream of being Western. The bed salesmen traveled to small villages and tried to persuade country people to give up sleeping on mattresses on the floor as they'd always done. まだ使ってないですけどね。まだこれからもうね、えー、お使いになりたいですよ。ええー、まあ気持ちはあります。ああ、そうです。<笑>新発の終わりとるとね。ええー、でも、えー、さん、まあこのね、カニもたくさん取れたようですね。<笑>カニが取れましたかちゃんと。でも奥さんね、こういうものお使いになってね、新種から生まれてくるんですよ。ね、いろんな。ね、ええー、太郎さんこういうのぜひね。ベッドがの生活はいいと。いいことになると思います。Our message was beds are better, so stop using futons. 日本のね、布団をやめなさいと。汚い。Futons are insanitary. ね、しかもゴミの溜まったところでね。At floor level, it was dirty and the air was bad. 空気を吸って寝るなんて。それも三十センチか四十センチの上で。Thirty centimeters above, on a bed, the air was fresh and it was more comfortable. 寝た方がいいし、空気を吸ってね。そういうことなんですね。It was like a dream. それがやはり夢なんです。The same relentless pressure for change affected every part of traditional life. Mori agar, kuchi kada tobu, tsuyoi tsune mitekte yo. Kami sama ga kueta koto ude ta. その上にちょっと運が良けりゃ全て男の思うままさ運が良けりゃ運が良けりゃ運が良けりゃ思うままさ男なら Twenty years after the war all the planning and hard work was paying off 神様も好きな子みんな酔っ払ってもちょっと運が良けりゃそれでどうだけの人生。
て気の向くままに好きなこと一目惚れした彼女にも目地地など下げちゃダメ知らぬ顔冷たいそうぶりわかるだろちょっと運が良けりゃ逆に向こうから乗せてくれる In 1964, the opening of the world's first high-speed railway and the holding of the Olympic Games in Tokyo confirmed how far they'd come and how fast. Though their recovery had been skillfully directed from the top, there'd been a consensus that the economy had to come first. Japanese were encouraged to think of themselves as one big, homogenous family, sharing the same goals. We had a strong desire to be number one in the world. That might sound arrogant, but the words number one in the world were often used. We hated to be behind any other country. The same emperor who denounced Japan's surrender in 1945 welcomed the world to a new democratic Japan. Of all the visiting athletes, few were as impressed as those who came from other Asian nations. The South Koreans arrived with a team of 200. Their own country, though Japan's closest neighbor, was still living in a different era. The son of a peasant who grew bean sprouts, Jiang Chan's son was one of the wrestlers. I was a country boy, and I was arriving in Tokyo for the first time. It seemed like a paradise to me as a young man. There were lots of tall buildings, there were highways, there were overpasses, things you couldn't see in Korea. Japan's gross national product had already overtaken Britain's and was about to pass West Germany to make her the third biggest economy in the world. Like most other visitors in the Olympic year, the South Koreans wondered how the Japanese had done it. We had the same circumstances. They experienced the Second World War, and we had the Korean War. Their country was left in ruins, and so was ours. But they were a lot more diligent, and we were less diligent. When we went one step, they went four or five steps. So it was no surprise that we were 40 or 50 years behind. Because their country had been a Japanese colony, the Koreans had no liking for the Japanese. This gave a special edge when Chang reached the final. I had to win because I was up against a Japanese. I wanted to achieve a miracle. But I lost by one point. Korea had been part of the Japanese Empire for 35 years. But liberation from Japanese rule in 1945 didn't bring the better life they'd hoped for. The country had been split into two, 
a communist regime in the north and an American-backed government in the south. An isolated agricultural people, they lacked Japan's industrial inheritance and trained manpower. Then, in 1950, they were swept into a civil war between North and South. While the Japanese had made money from their neighbor's war, the Koreans suffered on a massive scale. Three million were killed. As fighting raged up and down the peninsula, millions more became refugees. When Seoul, the southern capital, was about to fall to the communists, Quack Man Young and his family were among the thousands desperate to leave on the last train. There were so many people pushing and shoving and trying to get on the train. The train was full of arms and ammunition, so people had to sit on the roof. While we were trying to climb on, we heard two or three North Korean shells go off. The situation became chaotic. My sister and her child scrambled on. The train suddenly lurched forward, but I couldn't get on. I shouted to her, let's meet in Busan. Don't die, stay alive. At the end of the war, the two sides were left almost precisely where they began, and much of the country had been destroyed. The prospects for the South Koreans looked worse than ever. Kim Bok Soon tried to survive in a makeshift hut near Seoul. Our clothes were all torn, and you could see our bare skin. They were filthy, and we couldn't even wash them. That's how we lived, and people got sick. There were a lot of beggars asking for food. I had to beg for food myself. I had children to feed. So I begged and scavenged for things in the street. That's how difficult it was to live. In the 1950s, after the war, South Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. The average annual income was $67 per head, less than India or Ghana. They still faced a threat from the north and were propped up by American aid. Business and politics were corrupt and the country lurched from crisis to crisis. But South Koreans were about to be thrown into changes far more rapid and convulsive than anything Japan had lived through. In 1961, a group of military officers seized power in a coup led by General Park Chung-hee. Korea's new dictator promised a period of tough authoritarian rule which would strengthen the country against the North and restore national pride. As part of an early campaign against decadent habits, 4,000 young men were arrested for being hooligans. Their hair was cut to a length more fitting to a new mood of austerity. The black market was closed down, profiteers and corrupt businessmen arrested, and smuggled foreign goods seized and burnt. From now on, the national priority was to be high-speed economic development on the Japanese model, with General Park giving the orders. Park took close control of a series of big projects designed to give South Korea the base for a modern economy. The new road was driven across the country in record time to link South Korea's largest cities. Quagman Young, who'd lost his sister in the war, now worked as an engineer on the road. 
We had no real experience of road construction and there were no skilled workers. So we had to use books and learnt as we went along. We worked from dawn to dusk and after the sun went down we carried on working until midnight. Then at midnight we had to study the new machinery and the plans. The workers were able to sleep, but we managers had to use the sleeping time to learn what we'd do next. Even more than in Japan, the government told businessmen what kind of factories were to be built and where. The pride of the new Korea was to be a huge steelworks. Park said steel is national power. Workers were allowed no excuses. I went to my boss and said, we can't work because we don't have tools. He said, if you have all the tools and all the equipment needed, anyone can do it. You shouldn't complain. You should create something from nothing. If you haven't got it, make it. Make the tools with your own hands and get the work done on time. That's your job. A workforce of tens of thousands was commanded by a former general with a can-do military approach. If the workmanship fell below standard, he had it blown up. They worked so fast that accidents were frequent. As part of reparations for her colonial rule, Japan supplied much of the money, the machinery, and sent technicians. The Japanese were impressed with the Koreans. They were surprised that we could get things done much faster and shorten the work period. They said that we Koreans had the human qualities to create a miracle. In one leap, the Koreans had gone from making no steel at all to having one of the most modern plants anywhere with a huge capacity. On this day, Korea's President Park Chung-hee, who visited here ten times with a firm belief of building a Pittsburgh here at Yongil Bay, made a congratulatory address. I understand that this is the first example of its kind in the world. I regard you highly for your unselfish devotion and praise your efforts and achievement. They used their steel to start a new shipbuilding industry to challenge Japan's, and then to make their own cars. Investment began to reach the countryside too. But the government also wanted to get villagers to try and improve things by their own efforts. <laughs> A national new community movement was launched. 
Villagers had to give their time to public works for no pay. The government said all thatched roofs should be removed because they leaked, attracted insects and had to be re-thatched each year. All over Korea, thatch was replaced with tiles. New schools were opened and local teachers like Park Tae-hyun had a message for the children's parents as well. The important thing was not to hand down poverty to your children. You can't think of poverty as your destiny. Through working hard, through sweating, through being frugal, you'll have a chance to save your children from poverty. So let's work together. Park Tae-hyun made sure children starting school for the first time were clean. At the beginning, when we first started to wash the children, people would worry that they'd get some kind of skin disease. But after we got them clean and they saw the bright faces, the parents were happy. We got uniforms for them. We would wash and cut their hair. Eventually, they would clean themselves. And when children came from other villages, they would say, Oh, a black kid has come, and laugh. President Park's leadership became a cult, and his reforms were put through with ruthless efficiency. Koreans were exhorted to go on making sacrifices, while huge sums were being invested in industry for the future. Wages were kept down. Free trade unions couldn't operate. In thousands of noisy, ill-ventilated sweatshops, Korean workers toiled long hours a day making shoes, textiles or wigs for export. At the age of 18, Yi Chung Kak went to work in a textile mill in Incheon. The first day I got there, the moment I saw the conditions, I thought this is hell. That's the first impression I had. There were huge machines as big as houses, and there were a lot of them. There was so much noise you couldn't hear anything. We pulled thread out of cotton, which created so much dust we couldn't see each other. This was hell, and I felt really bottled up inside. When they tried to start their own union, the women were harassed by the management, which paid men to wait for them, armed with buckets from the latrines. The men brought in buckets full of excrement and said, let's see if you're going to vote, you women. And so you can see they've thrown it everywhere here. The workers would come into the office to vote and they said, why don't you try some shit? The union collapsed, the women were fired and their leaders beaten up or tortured by police. Park's political opponents were imprisoned and sometimes killed. He was widely hated and survived several assassination attempts.
In 1974, an assassin mortally wounded his wife. Showing his legendary self-discipline, he continued. But Park was himself killed by his own security chief in 1979. Though another general took over, it was increasingly hard to maintain the same dictatorial grip with which the miracle had begun. Industrial workers mounted strikes demanding huge pay rises. Students fought with police. Continuing violation of human rights brought condemnation of the South Korean government from abroad. In 1987, military rule ended and free elections were granted. In the late 1980s, South Korean workers finally got a bigger share of the nation's new wealth in their own pockets. Wages began to catch up with European levels. Real earnings doubled over 10 years. 99% of households had television. Excellent. Over 50% now had washing machines. Kim Bok Soon, who'd scavenged for food, now had her own fridge. I was fascinated by my fridge. I'd look to see if the water was cool. I'd open the door and keep drinking the water. Finally, my stomach bloated and I got a stomachache. I had to go to the lavatory all the time. But I'd go to the fridge again and drink even more water. And I cried because I was happy that I too could buy a fridge. From being one of the poorest countries in the world, South Korea had now risen to be the 18th largest economy. It would go on climbing to take 12th place by 1996. South Koreans were not only exporting cars, but buying them themselves. Among the proud new owners was Chang Chan Sun, the Olympic wrestler who'd marveled at Tokyo in 1964. I never thought that I could have a car or a house. But I bought a house and a car on the same day. I was so happy. After I brought the car home, I bowed to the car in an ancestral ritual. And then I took my family for a ride around. We stayed up all night celebrating. The shadow of a divided country and separated families hung over the new prosperity. But it was now possible to use television to help people who'd lost contact with relatives during the war. During special broadcasts, people stood outside the television studios with details of the loved ones they'd lost, hoping they'd come forward. There was a huge response. Kwak Man Young had last seen his sister at the Seoul station in 1950. Now they were reunited. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? She'd been working as a laundress at the other end of the country. Our country was stronger and richer, and television sets were in every home when the campaign took place. And because I found my sister so soon after the campaign started, I felt thankful to our country for granting my lifelong wish.
In 1988, it was the South Koreans' turn to host the Olympic Games. Now they had a chance to show the world their new prosperity. Korea! The South Koreans knew the high price that had been paid for their success. But in the Olympic glow, their own achievements still amazed them. It was a 180 degree change from one extreme to another. I don't think there's another country in the world that has gone through such an extraordinary development in such a short time. I think we've accomplished a great deal. But there was no monopoly on miracles. In the years since Japan had shown the way, others had started to experience the same explosive growth and rapid social change. They were called the tiger economies. Asians themselves began to boast of Asian values. They claimed their growing success was due to discipline and hard work, their schools and strong authoritarian control. 